Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of A Comedy Advice Podcast. My name is Stefan, and I'm your host. Joining me today is a very special guest. He's a national touring comedian with three specials out and one on the way. He's also America's favorite husband with one kid and one on the way. And he's also got the best calves that I have ever seen. Everybody, please welcome Steve <laughs> Revino. <laughs> How are you, man? Thanks for having me. I'm, you know... I'm always doing something and I'm always busy. So I apologize for being a little late on you. Oh, all good. All good. I'm usually late to things as well. So I'm very forgiving in that. But I'm appreciative that you're even taking any time to speak with little old Stefan. So first off, welcome to the show and thank you. Uh, no, thank you, but- man. I, I'm, you know, anytime I have an opportunity to, to do anybody's show, I mean, I, I'm happy to do it when people reach out. You know, you, you might be the next Joe Rogan. <laughs> you know, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I keep telling my wife. So we'll see what happens. But hundred million dollars. Here it comes. <laughs> Spotify deal. Here we come. That's right. I, I know that you said you're always doing things, and indeed you are. And in fact, on your podcast, Steve Trevino and Captain Evil, you were saying that one of your managers, Liam, was saying that he, one of the reasons he loves you is because you're able to take shit and turn it into manure, or turn, turn it into, turn it into yeah. fertilizer. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got you've got the podcast, which I believe was started in June, mid. Right. Yeah. Um, you've got your special coming out, My Life in Quarantine. My Life in Quarantine. Yeah, we're very excited. About, I mean, you know, when, when we talk about shit in the fertilizer, you know, my entire career has been on my own. And, you know, I, I, there's, there's nothing that's going to stop me. Nobody's going to tell me that I can't do stand up. So. I've really kind of taken this do-it-yourself kind of attitude towards it all. So um, the last two specials, my wife and I produced ourselves, paid for it ourselves. Uh, This special that's coming out, My Life in Quarantine, uh, we did that one and paid for it ourselves. And we're realizing that I don't need Netflix's permission or Amazon's permission or HBO's permission to, to distribute something to my fans that I already have. So we, we've just really taken that approach to let's just do it ourselves. Yeah, I totally agree. And as I was doing research about you, I saw, I stumbled across a video called My Journey on your YouTube page. And you you did elaborate on that in the story as well, how you were saying you 22 years old or 19 years old, you moved to LA, 22, you got a job as a writer on Comedy Central. And then these roles started appearing for you, but they were all like stereotype, um, you know, Mexican American, that type of thing. And it just seemed like Hollywood was trying to fit you into a mold or, and a lot of people, and some people say, Hey, this is the game that I got to play. And you, it it was a really inspiring story because you decided, no, I don't want to do that until it got to a point where you were like, should I do this? I mean, cause, cause you guys, um, were, were coming into some challenges and your wife was like, no, great wife, by the way. I I have a beautiful wife. Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> but, but you know, it was it, what the interesting thing is you know i stuck to my guns and i continued to say stop stereotyping us cast us as people as americans um and then now you know that's what's in the news right now you know um yeah. john, john leguizamo wanting to boycott um the emmys because you know we're not being represented properly and i've been saying it forever we cannot be represented properly if we continue to play uh, the servants and the maids and the, the nanny. And, you know, so I'm glad to finally see that, that at least people are, you know, here we are almost 20 years into my career, people just now figuring out what I have been saying forever ago, you know, and, yeah. and my fans don't, you know, they don't go, oh, I'm Steve fan because he's Mexican. No, they go, I'm a Steve Carino fan because he's funny. Because he's relatable yeah. because, you know, oh, and the bonus is cool. He's Mexican-American. So am I. That's awesome. So, you know, it, it has been one of those deals where Hollywood doesn't quite understand. And I'm not mad at Hollywood. They don't understand right. it. They don't get it. They don't understand right. uh, what I do, you know, and they can't, they can't get out of their little world to realize because I think you're in Phoenix, right? I am, yes. You know, when, when you're in Phoenix, when you're in Texas, when you're in New Mexico, when you're in Florida, when you're in, you know, cities like that where, man, Mexican-Americans run shit. 
We're not yeah. only the, the servants, right? We, you run into a Mexican American police officer or lawyer or doctor or teacher or, you know, and we're just Americans. And in, in LA, unfortunately, all these executives, the only Mexicans they, they deal with are Mexicans from Mexico. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you go to Beverly Hills and, and the fancy neighborhoods, I'm not there. The guy that's cutting their yard is. So that's yeah. their only reference, you know? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I feel like you have done an excellent job and have been a really good example of somebody that's just breaking the mold and then creating content that's Steve Trevino, which going to the content, I have to say that my wife and I, 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 I was like, you have to watch this. And we ended up watching till death. And I have to say that, that was, I can't remember the last time, and I watch a lot of specials. I have a lot of comedian guests on here. Sure. I can't remember the last time I've laughed that hard at a special. Oh man, I, but you know, that's why I live, you know, I live in Texas and, and I live a very normal life. You know, uh, normal neighbors, I cut my grass, I work in my yard, you know. Uh, it, so in order for me to be inspired, you know, to, to be relatable, to talk about, real things i have to live a real life so that you know that married couple um who watches me goes oh my god th these guys are living our life you know and, and when i lived in la you know i love being at the comedy store but the, the comedy store was not my thing right it wasn't right. um you know i like it and i love performing there and i love that club and i love uh performing there but it just, you know, I'm more of a Jim Gaffigan type, you know, and I started to yeah. realize, hey, man, you don't see Jim Gaffigan at the comedy store. You don't see Ray Romano at the comedy store or Jeff Foxworthy or any of these guys that are talking about their families. They're not at the comedy store. They're, they're living real lives somewhere, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And I remember I, I had heard an episode of Bert Kreischer's podcast that you were on and you were talking a little bit about that too, where you were like, I need to be around normal people to be able to come up with this material that I have. Cause that's where I connect. That's where I feel like the audience connects and Oh my God, I feel like that, is, that rings so true. And using your last special till death as an example, I mean, my wife and I, I'd poke her when I was like, Oh, see, yeah. this is, uh, it's not just you that or, you. or that is you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. And I, I think it was the, the, when your wife made you stop to get some pallets. For oh, dude. DIY. <laughs> I'm, I'm, Go ahead. <laughs> no, we're, we're putting shiplap in the baby room right now. So it, it, it doesn't end ever. But, but again, you know, I, I, I live, of, I, I grew up in a small town, man. I'm a, yeah. and I, I, I'd sit there at the comedy store and I would go, these guys who I like and I'm fans of, and, and yeah. uh, I consider them acquaintance friends. I'm like, I don't fit in here. I don't like being in the city. I don't, I don't like LA. I don't, I don't want to go to the nightclub, you know? So yeah. uh, over the years, you just kind of start finding your way and you start to realize that, Hey man, you know, uh, hanging out at the comedy store till four o'clock in the morning. That's not me. Yeah. I want to, yeah. I want to be home with my wife. I, I want to wake up in the morning with my kid to take him to school or make him breakfast, you know? And, mm -hmm. it, you know, and you'll realize too with comedy that you see these comics that, you know, they, they just kind of find their way, you know, I mean, Bill Burr's a, a perfect example of, you know, he's a regular guy. He just loves stand up, Right. So he goes to the comedy store, he kills and he goes home, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, so I, I've really found my way and my brand and, and what I want to talk about and who I want to be. And I've also got to the point where I don't care if other comedians don't think I'm funny. I don't care. I don't care if there's a big population of the country that goes, Oh man, Steve's, you know, Steve's comedy is, is not for me. That's fine. But I know that there's a, there's enough people out there that do like what I do that help me pay my bills. Yeah. Oh, there's a huge amount. I mean, I, I've seen an outpouring of when I'm seeing the podcast, I look down in the comments and people are just writing and you respond to them too, which is great. And yeah. it just, I feel like be, it's, it's very funny how you extract the humor out of 
fights with your wife or different scenarios where things are happening that are going on in your life that, like you said, are relatable to a lot of us folks and, and couples. And I feel like it also, one of the other things is it gives, when a comic gives an ob, like an observational or, or some sort of comedy where people can relate, I think you also have the layer that's just this visceral um, relation of, of feelings of love uh, and marriage holistically can be a beautiful thing. And seeing you guys on the podcast just really shows that your wife, her smile and her energy oh, is just so radiant. Oh, she's always, I mean, she's always laughing and we're always having a good time. And, and, uh, yeah. you know, my, co my comedy doesn't exist without the love that I have for my wife. And, and if I didn't love her, you know, I, I, I hate wearing my wedding ring. It bothers really? me. Oh, dude, it bugs me. I play with it. But imagine if I'm on stage shitting on my wife without a wedding ring, you know, that could like, look bad. <laughs> right. So, you know, people have to realize that I'm madly in love with my wife. Even though I don't want to wear the ring, I wear it for her. Right. And I do all these things for her. But if, but if it was out of hatred, if it was out of anger, if, if people felt that Re Renee and I did not have a good relationship, the act would be in trouble. But it's yeah. all very real. It's all very honest. It's, it, is, it is truly who I want to be uh, and who I'm trying to be. Uh, a husband, a family man. And I, I think that comes through. I think people see that, you know? Oh, big time. And then I, I also think that's good reinforcement for other people because sometimes if you're kind of isolated, you, your partner, especially literally isolated in, in these times, but you might have these fights and sometimes that gets amplified and you're isolated in it and you think, man, it's just the end, like what's going on. And when you hear funny stories, it's funny, first off, you can relate, second. And then third, it's just like, oh, there's this big layer of love around these, these little dots of contention and fights and things like that. So I think it's also, for me at least, encouraging to be like, oh, I'm not the only one that fights with my <laughs> wife over salt and vinegar potato yeah. chips. And well, so you know, the, the, the funny part too, man, is, is how many people come up to me and say, hey, you saved our marriage. We literally thought that we were, the, the way we fought was not normal. And we were on the verge of divorce. And then we see your show and we go, oh, it's just marriage. It's just part of it. So, I mean, that's been, you know, really touching for me and my wife to have people reach out and say, you know, because of you guys, me and my husband now have something to watch together. You know, yes. because, of, because of you guys, we both like a comedian because normally he likes a comedian. She doesn't, you know, she likes something. He doesn't like it. Right. So it, it, you know, it really does feel good to actually feel like I'm actually bringing people together. And at the end of the day, I write my jokes with heart first and then I make them funny. If the joke doesn't have any heart, if the joke doesn't have any emotion, then I, I don't tell it. And that's why, you know, when we decided, you know, to film my life in quarantine, we did that because, you know, here's this moment in time in our lives that we were all in quarantine and we were all dealing with what was happening to us. Well, I wrote an entire hour just about that. And then I thought to myself, man, in three months from now, I'm not going to be doing that material at all. So I better tape it and I better film it. So that's what we did. Damn. Wow. Yeah, I was actually going to ask about that because it's coming out October 15th. And... October 15th, and, and we're going directly to the consumer. Um, nice. And then part of the proceeds are going to go to our veterans. Uh, so hopefully, because nice. uh, Veterans Day is November 11th, that we can raise, you know, a few mm -hmm. thousand bucks that we can give to our veterans. Oh, man. That's awesome. That is so cool. And um, I'll have a link for it for, is it on pre-order right now? Uh, not yet. I think next week or okay. two weeks. Okay, perfect. This, this should well, come out in about a week or so. So I'll get the link and I'll put that in there yeah, so people absolutely. can pre-order. But, but you that's, know, and, and it's one of those things too, where it's happening now. So I don't have time to go shop it to Netflix. I don't have time to go shop it to the networks. You know, it, this is all happening now. And three months from now, we're not going to remember what it was like to be in quarantine or at least most of the country. I mean, obviously, yeah. you know, LA is still 
locked down and New York is yeah. still locked down. But for the most part, I mean, I'm, I'm here in Texas. I've been doing stand up for the past three months now. Wow. Yeah. You know? Arizona has been very similar. I think it's been about three months that a lot of our comedy clubs have been open too. So. Well, but, been... we, but we, but we need it, you know, we need an escape. You know, that's what the movies is, right? You go to the, you take your wife to a movie and then for two hours you sit and you in, hopefully enjoy, you know, but now that that's been taken away, you know, you think about people's mental health, the things that, that people are dealing with, at, at, you know, on a daily basis that they're not used to, but there's no outlet. You can't go have a drink at a bar. You can't, you can't go to a bowling alley. You can't, you can't go to a comedy show, can't go to a movie. Those are all things that we need to have a healthy life. I think you're right. And I think that if there's maybe not one thing, but one of the things I hope people take out of this experience is the importance on mental health and the importance of entertainment, like comedians and stand up, music, et cetera. Cause that's really right. stuff that I feel like maybe just people don't understand how important it really is, but it's something right. that just really gives you um, you know, kind of a refresher and, and helps you kind of set, hit the, hit the reset button on right. the day or on your mood. So, well, and I mean, you know, you have people that, you know, that's their thing, right? We go and watch live music, you know, me and my wife, we go and that has been completely disrupted. Right. Or yeah. you have, I mean, there's people that come to my show, uh, and you know, we've been so blessed that we, we sell out almost everywhere we go. But occasionally you'll get those people that go, we just come every week. You know, we get tickets to every comedian every weekend. Yeah. This is what we do. We love it. Yeah. So to take that away from somebody like that, it, it's, it's, it's not easy. I mean, I, I dealt with depression for the first time in my life during quarantine. I, I did not know what depression was. And, and mm -hmm. it's one of those things that you really don't know until you actually feel it. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I got depressed. I wasn't going on stage. I felt worthless. I felt like my career was being taken from me. Um, and I, I mean, there was days I couldn't get out of bed. You know, it was very, it was very real. And then thank yeah. goodness my wife goes, get your ass off the sofa. This is happening to everybody. Let's take this shit and turn it into fertilizer. And the two of us got up and started doing that. And it's been, you know, amazing. Even the podcast. We started the podcast because of quarantine. Yeah. We had no interest in doing a podcast. And then I came up with this idea to do um, uh, Pardon the Interruption. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Pardon the Interruption on ESPN, no. but they have topics and they only have two minutes on every topic. Well, I go, why don't we do the husband wife version of that and call it Pardon the Bitchy? <laughs> and then, you know, so Renee and I would get topics to bitch about. And we both nice. only have a certain amount of time. And I mean, that's where the podcast started. And organically, it's now grown into, we've had over a million views on it. So it's been really cool. That's incredible. Yeah. And you guys are up to like, what, episode 17 now? It's been... I think so. Six, 15 or, or, or 16, I think. But I mean, it's been fun. I mean, we enjoy it. I enjoy sitting down with my wife for that hour. And, and it, that is, it's actually helped our marriage because we're much more civil <laughs> being recorded. <laughs> so it's nice. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's a little inspiring because around the same time that I, I had found you on social media and I, I started to, this is kind of weird to say, fall in love with you, but just like really be a, a super fan of everything you're doing and the podcast and everything. And at that time I was starting a podcast with my wife where we're do we, she's Brazilian. I'm American. I speak Portuguese. So we were going to kind of talk about the differences between America oh, and great. Brazil. Great. And I was like, I don't know, you know, cause sometimes we get in fights and then we might cancel something. And I'm like, are we going to be able to continuously do this? And it's been working so far. And I feel like I've been looking to you and Renee as, uh, as inspiration for that. And now my wife, she says, by the way, you are the funniest comedian she's heard so well. far. So. That is awesome. Well, and uh, yeah. again, it's, it's, it's simple stories, right? It's, yeah. it's, the, it's the fight over the trash bag. Yeah. You know, uh, and it's, I remember walking on stage one day and I go, can she just take out the trash every once in a while? <laughs> right. And then I got a laugh. 
And I'm like, oh, maybe there's something here. So then I describe in great detail on yeah. our fight with the trash bag and how I'm the trash man, she's the bag lady. And now all of a sudden you have this really, this bit that I can't tell you how many times people send me pictures of the dude with the trash bag in his hand going, hey man, trash man here, you know, and then she's got the bag, bag lady, you know, but it's, you know, it's, it's my life and, and to be able to put it out there like that to where people like yourself um, and your wife go, man, this is really funny. That's the hard part, you know, and, and people actually think it's easy what I do because I'm just talking about trash bags, but it's, yeah, it's not easy. Yeah. It's hard. And I, I put a lot of time and effort into it. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And then one of the things that could be an obstacle too, for me personally, writing and creating jokes and things like that, I haven't talked too much about marriage. And one of the things that I've been thinking about is, is I, the fights that we have, I try to forget them because I try <laughs> yeah. to think, God, let's just bury that and then bury yeah. that body and then just keep going forward. But now, since I've started to listen to you, I've started to try and dig back up some of those old stories and think, okay, now that I'm not super hurt or pissed, um, how can I think about this? And, you know, there are- Well, you have to being... remember that, that being super hurt and being super pissed is yeah. the fuel. Right. And that's what makes it funny. Right. Yeah. If you go up there and you go, I am super pissed off about this. And let me tell you what happened. Then the emotion is what's funny. The frustration is what's funny. You know, you, you take somebody like Sebastian Maniscalco, who is, is just at the top of the game right now. And he has a lot of emotion and his emotion is disgust. Right. Yes. He speaks yes. with this like, like, what are you doing? <laughs> You know, and you know that that's him, right? Yeah. When, he, when he says, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I don't stay at an Airbnb. You can <laughs> tell that he's disgusted by it. So it's the emotions that get the audience invested, right? Yeah. Not, not, so much, not so much the story or the joke. It's the feelings of, can you take out the fucking trash? <laughs> that feeling right of come on that the audience gravitates to so don't ever be afraid to take something that you're afraid of something that you're mad about pissed off about um all the emotions angry sad whatever and and take it and put it on stage you know we um my wife and i had a miscarriage uh in 2019 and and oh, it was one of the hardest times of our lives and we just i decided to talk about it so I am doing um, a whole bit on our miscarriage and what we went through and what we went through after the miscarriage. And I don't think there's a comedian out there that is doing a miscarriage joke, but it's not a joke. It's my life. And this is what we yeah. dealt with so that, so that when I talk about my miscarriage and then I tell the journey of where we are today, it, you know, people get, people get invested in it. Right, because it's real. It's happening. Yeah. Jeez. Well, before we get into the self help and answer some questions, I just wanted to reflect and and just say thanks because this advice that you've given through what you've said so far has been really helpful for me, and I think the audience, especially aspiring comics or whomever, anyone that needs to get in touch with their emotions, can yeah. kind of gear it into a, a constructive and possibly funny way. So. Thank you, Steve. Is there, before we get into the questions, is there anything you want to plug? Anything that you've got going on that you want to share with the world? No, not really. I mean, you know, I, I always feel like my work speaks for itself. And if, if they're listening to this interview and they think that I'm interesting enough, uh, they'll find me. So I'm not too worried about it. Nice. Awesome. Well, we're going to, we've got about five minutes left. So we're going to answer some questions. These have been sent in from fans. We've got our first question. This is actually found from Reddit, and it's by our, it's found by our fan Raven. It says, my wife continually misplaces my belongings and I always end up late to work. Hmm. Recently, my wife has gotten into this habit of moving my belongings and then forgetting where she places them. It takes me up to an hour sometimes to look for my car keys. This has slowly started to piss me off. So I started moving my stuff onto a shelf that she can't reach. That hasn't worked either because she carries a stool around with her to stand on to get to higher places. So she's been moving them when she finds them on higher shelves. How do I get this woman to stop behaving this way and own up? 
that you can't. <laughs> that when, there's nothing you can do, buddy. Because by the way, you know you're, you're you're reading this, and it's like that's a bit, right? If if that was, you know, the, the I already picture his wife with the stool and her being five foot three and her climbing around and and getting stuff. So I mean, it's already hilarious. And the funny part is, she ain't gonna change. It doesn't matter what you do. She is going to do what she wants because for the most part, women and wives have zero consequences. I can definitely uh, t- attest to that. So, so I, I, good, luck. I, good luck, buddy. That's, what I, that's I, all I can tell Raven. Yeah, that's what I think too. I think instead of trying to change your wife, you should try and change yourself. So just an hour <laughs> earlier, go to work yeah. or try to get to work. S- just s- spend that or, or, hour. Go ahead. Or make copies of your keys that you keep with you all the time. That is way smarter. I like that. Instead of spending an extra hour yeah. a day trying to look for your keys, just make the copy, hide them. I don't know. Put them in an urn right. somewhere. She'll never okay. find them. Put them, in then... the, put them in a safe. <laughs> Perfect. All right. We've got this next question. It's from Reddit found by our friend, Sam. Thank you, Sam. It says, me and my wife are planning for second baby. We already have a daughter and we are now planning for a boy. So what's your advice on what to eat to have more chances of boy? Thank you. Well, you know what? That's really funny because <laughs> you're not, so we, we, we were the, my wife and I wanted a boy and we wanted to have a boy first and, and we were blessed with a boy. So I'm talking to the doctor and I go, I go, okay, we want to have a boy. What can we do? And then she goes, she goes, well, boy sperm is very fast, but it dies oh. quickly. Female sperm is slow, but it lives forever, which, by the way, that explains a lot about life, right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I told the the doctor, I go, so what are you trying to say? And she goes, well, the, the, she goes, you got to go balls deep. She goes, "The, the, the, the deeper you penetrate, the closer the sperm is to the egg. So therefore, the boy will win. No way. But if but if you if you're having sex and you're you don't penetrate deeply, then the the male sperm will die before it gets to the egg, and the female will get there. Wow. So that's what we were told. It worked. I went balls deep, and uh, we we have a little boy, and then with with the daughter. And it's going to sound crazy. I would not ejaculate. I would only put half in for the ejaculation. And we ended up having a daughter. So I don't know if it's real or what, but I do know, and and I could get this wrong. There's also foods that you can eat uh, to, to encourage the male sperm versus the female sperm. And I believe the male sperm is like acidic, but you have to look at that. Okay. Um, but we did what the doctor said when it came to the difference in the sperm and it worked out for us. So I wish him luck. That's great. I wonder if there's some sort of little catchphrase, like, uh, you know, if it's yellow, let it mellow, it's like, um, (laughs) balls deep for a boy you seek (laughs) or something. (laughs) Something like that. Right. It was great. It was great talking to you, man. I wish you all the luck in the world and I hope we get to meet each other soon. Yes. I'm going to be looking out to see when you come to Phoenix, hopefully soon. I just got booked for February, or March 2021. Nice. So awesome. we'll see you soon, my friend. Thank you. All right. See you soon. Thank you, Steve. Bye-bye.